Hey everybody, I want to remind you of the different ways that you could send your tithes and your offering. You could do it through texting. If you don't have access to Google Play or the App Store, just send a text to 601-273-4609 and send it to the word GIVE. After that, you'll receive a text message back and then just follow the simple instructions, the simple steps, and you're all set up. Also, you can use the Tidely app. Just download the app from the Google Play or the App Store, and you can set up the amount that you want to give, and you can send it to Springs of Praise World Outreach Center, or you can mail it to Post Office Box 549, Crystal Springs, Mississippi, 39059. If you want to drop it off at the uh, church office, the office is open Tuesdays through Thursdays from 10 a.m. until 4 p.m. And as always, I want to thank you for watching this program. Okay, here's our scripture for this morning. Philippians 1, 19 and 20, For I know that this shall turn, everybody say turn. turn. I want you to remember that word in just a little bit. It will turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ according to these two words, according to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. Expectation and hope. We'll come back to that in just a, a little bit. Father, thank you for precious people that have gathered to hear the word and those that are going to be joining us in, uh, by, by the way of the tube. We're just the channel. We're just asking you to bless this. In Jesus' name, you may be seated. Amen. <clears throat> when I was younger, I must admit that I had a little bit of a flaw, just a tiny one, mind you, but I liked to watch The Price is Right, and as a, as a young man, that's when it came out, I, I thoroughly enjoyed that, and we all know how many of you will admit with me that you've watched The Price is Right, that's about everybody here, because it went on and on with Bob Barker forever. But I'm telling you, I enjoyed that where, where you had contestants that, that uh, made some cash or won some trips or whatever by guessing the prices of merchandise. Now, you may have liked the ending with the doors opening and they got a ch chance to uh, put their price on whatever that was. I liked the beginning. I love the beginning. Because the beginning was a voice. You are the next contestant on The Price is Right. <laughs> Immediately, there was either one or two responses. With a man, it was a yell, usually. And with a woman, it was a scream. And like a rocket, they shot up from their seat, stepped on toes getting out to the aisle, high-fiving everybody all the way down, hollering and jumping up and down, and some doing even handsprings. I mean, this was an excited four people that were coming down to the front to be on The Price is Right. They were so excited, and they had not won one prize. They had not won the vacation trip to Hawaii. No beautiful appliance. No shiny sports car. Nothing. And yet they were so excited over the expectation of the possibility of winning it. Wow. Do you know that that atmosphere at the beginning of the show is really what carried that show for years? And did you know that that excitement is what God looks for? I want you to look at this scripture right here in Luke chapter 3 and verse 15. Now, as the people were in what? Expectation. expectation. They all reasoned in their hearts about John, and then John's going to talk to them and says something about that expectation. You do understand how powerful that verse is. 
400 years, they have not had a word from heaven. That's older than the United States of America exists. 400 years, God's not talking. None. Zero. No prophet. No blazing uh, uh, fire from heaven. No burning bush. No nothing. For 400 years, God shuts heaven off. But all of a sudden, he raises up a guy that looks like Riley. All we need is the camel skin on you, Riley, and we got you. And he comes on the scene, and he begins to speak, and this happens. Expectation begins to happen. These people begin to expect God must be up to something. And one translation says that this word expectation means to stand on your tiptoes in anticipation. They were that expectant something was about to happen. Well, I'm telling you, that was the atmosphere that God had to have in order to bring just Jesus into this world. John says, I've come to make every valley that's low raise it up, which means depression. It represents depression. I've come to make every mountain that's high brought down. And Jesus said you can speak to this mountain and cast it into the sea. Mountains representing problems and, and difficulties and obstacles. And I've come to make every crooked way straight. That's what John is telling them. He says, I've come to get depression off of you, to get the problems off of you, to get your life straightened out. I've come to tell you, what, by me? No, there's one greater than I that's coming whose shoelaces I'm not even worthy to untie. I baptize you in water, but he's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. In other words, he was say, folks, you're anticipating, your expectation is great, but it's really going to get great when you see the one that's coming. I believe that in order for God to move, he has to have an atmosphere change. You have a dead, dry, non-responsive audience that don't believe for anything. You're going to get exactly what you came in believing. If you came believing for nothing, you get nothing. But I tell you, I stood outside of the revival down in Pensacola, Florida. I stood for hours and some of the people we stood around had been there all night long. They camped standing and sitting on the sidewalk. Lines all the way down the block and, uh, as far as you can see. Yeah. I'm telling you, I got, we went, we went to such a way and we maneuvered to be about 30 or 40 feet from the door. And when they opened those doors, I tried to get in as quick as I could. I did not have to walk. There were so many bodies pressing me, they carried my body along. This is absolutely true. And when I walked in the door, almost every seat was filled within the capacity of one minute. 2,000 seater auditorium. We only, in my group, had to sit back in some seats nobody took, and we didn't know, well, these are pretty decent up against the wall. And then we found out why nobody wanted them. All the air conditioning for the building came up underneath us. And then some somebody had enough sense to bring us some things to cover up with because we froze to death all night. Nobody had any sense. They had any sense sat there. But I'm telling you, what happened in Brownsville revival when people stood for hours and even 24 hours waiting for the move of God was phenomenal. It was a million and a half people getting saved. It was healings and deliverances and all kinds of miracles taking place. Because why? The anticipation, the excitement, the expectation was so high. The Holy Ghost says, I found a place I can work. And you know what? God is still looking for us to get on tiptoe. We need to expect God to heal our families. We need to expect that pain to leave our body. We need to expect to be delivered from drugs and alcohol and defeat and depression. We need to expect God to move today. Can somebody praise the Lord? In Acts chapter 3, we've always told the story of Peter and John. Him speaking to the lame man stuck between two places. He can't go in the temple and he can't really work in the secular world. He's stuck between them. 
And Peter and John go up to him. And Peter says, silver and gold have I none. And we know the miracle. But we miss the atmosphere. The reason the miracle worked is because it says, and the man looking up expected to receive from them. Yeah. Praise God. Oh, you say, come on, preacher. He just expected some money. That's right. That's all he wanted. But it was an expectancy. That's right. And God always does exceeding abundantly above all that you ever ask or think. He'll do beyond what you're yeah. wanting. You understand that? He'll go beyond it. And that's exactly what, and he's springing up, he's jumping, he's having a good time because he set the atmosphere of expecting something. Yeah. Do you know that Jesus made this statement? He said, out of your belly to the woman at the well shall flow, there'll be a well of water springing up if you drink the water I give you. There'll be a well springing up into everlasting life. Just like that guy began to dance and spring up because his ankles were healed. Yeah. Do you know that word spring up is the word that's used for little children? It is directly cor uh, correlated with children. When you tell a child, we're going to go get an ice cream cone. Well, they, no, I mean, they're jumping and springing. We're going to go to the park. Uh, 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 hey, we're going to go see a movie. I mean, they're springing up and down. And he was saying this. When you drink the water I give you, it doesn't lie dormant. And you look like you sucked on some persimmons and some lemons, it looks like something springing up inside of you, making you excited on your tiptoe, believing that God's going to do some things, and it'll spring all the way to everlasting life. That's how far it's going to go. Forever. Did you know this? One of the things that COVID's done to us is taking a four-letter word out of our vocabulary. And my wife didn't even know I was going to be sharing this. She shared it. H-O-P-E, hope. The hopelessness that I've seen on the faces of pastors when I've gone to these meetings this past year from North Carolina to Tulsa and looked at me and I mentoring as pastors and let them tell you what's happening that's not good in their churches. Hopelessness is what COVID did to a lot. 3,000 3,000 pastors a month resign because of the hopelessness. It's not going anywhere. It's not building back. It looks like we're still stuck in the same old rut and they're giving up. I'm glad the Bible calls God. And you that are listening by way of the channel, he is called the God of all hope. Amen. All hope. You say, what does that mean? Look up the word hope. It means confident expectation. Con I've got a confident expectation. I can't even have faith if I don't have hope. For faith is the substance of things hoped for. It starts in my hoping. And my hoping, if I ain't got the faith for it yet, but I'm hoping it can happen. And then if I keep a hoping, I can get some faith to believe attached to that. Look at this verse of scripture again in Philippians. It says, according, he says, what's going to turn? I know this is going to turn. What's going to turn? What's going to turn? I'll tell you what it is. Paul is in the worst place of his life. He's in jail. These accommodations are horrible. He says, I know that this horrible situation is going to turn. How, what, what, for my salvation? I'm getting out of here. My apologies. I couldn't hear what you said. Well, you know what? Siri, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> you that are watching by the tube, I tell you what, I think Gene, Gene did that to me. On purpose. There's a rooster call. He will not repeat it. It's turned off. <laughs> What's going to turn? Quit laughing. Okay. What's going to turn is this horrible situation by three things. Number one, by your prayers. By the supply of the Holy Spirit. But the clincher is according to the degree of my expectation yes. and my hope. Yes. That's the degree it's going to turn. It won't be just the prayers. It won't be just the Holy Spirit. I participate by hoping. I participate by expecting. I believe, I tell you what, the healing that came to your dad so easily. I've never seen anybody receive healing like his dad. I'd go over there and they'd call me and say, Paul Paul's sick. And I'd go over and I'd pray for him. 
It's just like Paul Paul was saying, the moment you pray for me, I'm going to give him a healing. I'm expecting it. I didn't have to hardly even pray the prayer in public. Am I telling the truth? Because he always had an expectation. God's always going to come through for me. And guess what? God did it. According to my expectation. Oh, wow. You know, they took some rats one time and uh, did an experiment with them some years ago. Scientists did this. Now, I know this sounds cruel, and we don't want anybody that has animal rights. You're an activist. My wife and I, don't tell anybody. My wife and I went down. To, we were at Savannah Beach for the wedding of our daughter in, uh, what, excuse me? Hilton Head Island. Oh, wow, we were Hilton Head. Uh, we walked on a forbidden place that was just for the guests, but we did it anyway. So anyway, we were out there, and there were three starfish fresh that came up at our feet and we picked them up and we were so excited they were perfect starfish still alive and we had a lady come up there and she was a starfish saver <laughs> you got what you got in your bag yeah uh -huh, uh -huh. and she made us put two of them back because she didn't know we had a third <laughs> <laughs> That is one of the most stupidest things I've ever told because of the fact I don't even know where I'm at in this, in this message right now. Oh, I'm on the rats. <laughs> rats. It's the Lord. It's the Lord blocking this rat story. Okay. So if I have anybody that's, an, you know, they took those rats and they put them in a tub and they, they checked it, clocked it. How long can they swim before drowning? Because they let them drown. At 10 minutes, they drowned. Nine minutes, 30 seconds, the panic, and then the drowning at 10. They took some more rats. Now, I don't know where, where they got those rats. I think they got them out of Washington, because I think there's some rats up there. <laughs> and so they, they uh, got some more rats, put them in the water, and they let them swim, and they clocked it again. Exactly nine minutes and 30 seconds, I'm telling you the truth, panic came in those rodents, and they knew they were going to drown. And when the panic was there, the scientists reached in and picked them up, dried them off, put them in a warm place, fed them, let them rest, put them back in the water. And see, to see how long they last. This time they didn't last 10 minutes. They went for 18 minutes. 18 minutes. At 17 minutes and 30 seconds, the panic set in. And you can see in their little bitty eyes that they couldn't go much longer. So he picked them up. Took them out, washed them, uh, rubbed them down, fed them, warmed them, gave them rest, and then put them back in. And when he did, they didn't last 10 minutes or 18 minutes. They went for 30 minutes. They repeated this until those very rats that they started with swam 37 hours. 37 hours versus 10 minutes. What made the difference was hope, an expectation that just when I feel like that I can't paddle water any longer, a hand is going to reach down and pick me up, dry me off, put some food in my mouth, and begin to comfort me. I'm telling you, the rats came to preach to you today and tell you just when you feel like you can't go any further, that this is the end, that your swimming days are over, an unseen hand from heaven reached down for me, way down for me, and picked me up, dried me off, said, son, every time from here on out, when you feel like you can't go any further, look for a hand, because the hands come. Somebody needs to praise the Lord if you believe the hand of God can save I fed that down to my gizzard and don't even have one. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Turn to somebody and say, you're not a rat. Because <laughs> I, I felt that I was looking in some beady eyes while ago. I, I wanted to read this for you. I know that this is a little... Very varied from what I normally do. But I wanted to read this just momentarily. This is John Wesley's diary. 
This is in the 1700s that the man wrote this. If you don't know who John Wesley is, do you know the Methodist Church? The United Methodist Church would not be here today if John Wesley had not established it and founded it. In the early days, do you know that we as a denomination are Pentecostal Methodist? I don't know if you knew that. We're Westland. Our doctrine is Westland. If, you, if we talk to a United Methodist pastor, I can, in fact, the one in town, I've talked to him and told him what we were. And he said, man, we're brothers. Yeah. We just believe in the charisma, the Pentecostal glossolalia, a little different. But other than that, we are Methodist. Surprise you? Well, but this man did a phenomenal job. But I want you to re listen to his early days, what he said. I'm reading directly from the diary. His entries. Sunday morning, May 5th, preached at St. Anne's, was asked not to come back anymore. Sunday night, May 5th, same day, preached at St. John's. Deacon said, get out, stay out. Real good record. Sunday morning, May 12th, this is within a month's time, preached at St. Jude's. Can't go back there either. This is what he wrote. I like the way he told of his next preaching assignment. Here's what he said. Sunday morning, May 19th, preached in St. Somebody Else's. He didn't want to put the name in there. Deacons called a special meeting and said I couldn't return. Sunday night, May 19th, preached on the street. Kicked off street. His exact words. Kicked off street. Sunday morning, May 26th, preached in Meadow. Chased out of meadow because bull was released during service. <laughs> Somebody didn't like the sermon. Boy, John was not having a good week, a month. Sunday morning, June 2nd, preached at the edge of town. Kicked off the highway. He's going further and further out. Sunday night, June 2nd, preached in a pasture. 10,000 people came to hear me. He didn't get to that 10,000, and thousands upon thousands began to get saved. In fact, he shook two continents for God. England and America had revival under John Wesley, who had everything under the sun, like your cars sometimes that break down and break down and keep breaking down. Everything went wrong. What in the world made him keep going with that kind of record was simply the fact he had a hope that one of these days this is going to take yeah. off. I've got an expectation that this is not the end. Getting kicked out of everywhere and off the street and everything is not my destiny. I've got something better than that. And John Wesley came out the hero of the story. I'm telling you, your hope matters to God. Yeah. Do you understand that? Amen. Richard, your hope matters to God. It does. That you have that belief. What things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. If you don't have the believing, you don't have the receiving. You've got to have the hope. Do you know that those women we're talking about Easter Sunday morning, those women when they went out there on Easter Sunday morning weren't expecting to see a resurrected Jesus. They expected a dead Jesus. They went to anoint a dead body. They went to mourn. They went to weep, shed some tears. There's nothing good could come out of a graveyard, they thought. And besides that, they had a problem. Bad enough to be mourning, to be upset at what you've lost. But now you've got a compiled problem. We can't even get in. But we know what happened. God sends an angel, rolls the stone away, and when the women get there, I like that. He's sitting on it. You say, why, why is he sitting on it? Because he's, I believe he's pointing to the women. And he rebukes them. Why are you here? That is 
is not a compliment. Why are you here seeking the living among the dead? You don't go to the cemetery to see live folk. Why are you depressed? Why are you, is your head low? Why are you so sad? Because I tell you what, he says, he has risen. I don't know if you know the word risen, but I'm just going to do it in front of you. Risen is up. You've been down, but you up. In other words, ladies, get your heads off your ch chest and look up. He's up. He's risen. He's up from the grave. He arose with a mighty triumph over his foes. Do you know that the Nazis would not allow a Jew in a concentration, concentration camp to look up? If they caught you looking up, they'd hit you in the head with the butt of a gun. Or they'd whip you. Why did they stop thousands and millions of Jews from ever doing this? It's because when you look up, it means I got hope. Something's not, this is not it. There's something I'm expecting beyond this. That's why the Bible says, lift up your heads when all these bad things are going on. Your redemption, lift it up. Yeah, your redemption is growing now. You pray, lift your heads. You saints of God that we know and you can. God is saying, lift up your head. Your redemption's drawing nigh. Amen. That's the hopeful look. Zacharias didn't have it. Luke chapter 1, he, he didn't have it. He had the downward look of a man that couldn't have a baby. An old man. And when the angel comes and says, Zacharias, you and Elizabeth are going to have a baby. He was so off the chart that he couldn't believe it. How can this thing be? Mary asked the same question. But Mary's, how can this be, was full of faith. His was full of doubt. We know because the angel said, you know what? The whole time of this pregnancy, you ain't going to be able to open your mouth. Because what's coming out of it is a negative junk. And I'm going to make you mute. Yeah. And that's what needs to happen to people around you. I wonder if this morning we got muted. If we got a bunch of unbelief coming out of our mouths. Uh, but I wonder how many of you have a problem talking. <laughs> yeah. But when you get around people that have an expectancy, Mary, you're going to have a baby. You are going to be expecting. Really? Yeah. And your cousin of old age, Elizabeth, you know? Yeah, she's expecting right now. And when this expecting woman went to the house of this expecting woman, Elizabeth says, Dear Wanky Virgin, Hey, Mary, you just bumped me. How did I bump you? When the baby inside of you came in the presence of the baby inside of me, I got the bumping all on the inside. Because you're expecting and I'm expecting and something's happening on the inside of us because we're both expecting. You see, you don't know that I come to church selfishly most of the time. Because if I can get around the Jesus in you and the Jesus in me and we bump this thing together, we can see some things accomplish. Somebody, I can praise the Lord. Show me that scripture. Chris, thank you for doing this for me. He prays a prayer that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened, that you'd know these things. What? 19. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power? Leave that up there, Chris, if you don't mind. Toward us who what? Who, who expect? According to the working of his mighty power. The exceeding power. God has exceeding power. What does that mean? That, listen to me. I'm almost finished. That means God's power 
always exceeds itself. Did you know that God has never found the end of his own power? He's never had a question that he didn't have an answer for. He's never had anything he wanted that he couldn't make. He stood on nothing because there was nothing to stand on and spoke out of his mouth. And when he spoke, molecules and atoms bumped into each other and all of a sudden you've got something happening that's never happened before. You've got mountains and rivers and valleys and stars and the angels, the Bible says in the book of Job, you listen to me, the angels shouted together in creation's morning. How did, what did they shout? I believe they shouted, wow, God, we've never seen this power before. That's got to be the end of it. And God says, wait a minute, I can exceed that. Watch this. And he goes, and he goes to the earth, and he digs in the ground, scoops out a beautiful, handsome guy like Jack. <laughs> Already had a tan on him. Scoops him out, reaches over and <laughs> breathes into a chunk of dirt. And the dirt gets up and starts walking, and the angels are walking, watching him name over 3,000 species of beetles. That's overkill. And he, I'm talking about all the different animals. He got tired after a while because he, he named them different things, and finally he just said blue, bluebird, <laughs> red, red bird. I mean, you know, yeah, I, I think I'd run out of names too. But I'm telling you, they watched this guy act like God create. And the angel says, wow, he looks like you, the daddy. But that's got to be the ultimate. No, no, no. No, no. I can exceed that. Watch this. And he takes his own diadem, his crown off. He walks down through 42 different generations into the dressing room of a womb of a woman called Mary. And allows her to burp him and clean him up. And, and now he's walking across the earth acting like his daddy. Commanding lepers to be healed. Walking on water. Glory to God. Causing the bread and the fish to multiply. This guy. And the angels look at this Jesus and they said, Goodness, that's got to be it. God said, No, that's not it. I can exceed that. Hey, listen, angels. Come here. Come here. Listen. I'm so much God that I can create my own mother and nurse at the mother I created. I'm so much God that I can create all these mountains, but I can specifically create a Mount called Calvary. And I can make all these trees, but one of them specifically I'm making for me. And it's going to be up on that hill, and I'm going to allow myself to be hung up there and die. And everybody else is going to think, game over, devil winning, Jesus lost. Oh, yeah. But you know what? Angels, I want you to know something. I'm going to lay in that grave for three days and three nights, but on the third day. Oh, yes. Yeah. That's why in a little bit when we were talking about it, I ran out of that grave, and we were thinking of Jesus when he ran out of that grave. I, I get excited about Resurrection Sunday. I don't know about you. I, I'm in awe in the Bible. I'm in awe. At all of a sudden, they're, they're running away from Moabite raiders. In, 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 the, in the book of 2 Kings and, and, and they haven't got any place to put their buddy that lost his life in the battle and they see the raiders coming and they just dump him in a hole having no idea that that was the bones of Elisha that was in that hole yeah. somehow the hole had opened up to where that the body of the dead man, the dead soldier could get down to the body of the dead prophet and, and when a dead man killed in battle touches the bones of a man that's been dead for decades. There's so much power in a dead man's body. Glory to God. I am amazed. Amazed at Elijah. Amazed at Elisha. Laying on two different boys. Raising them from the dead. Jesus, Talitha Kume. Arise, little girl. Touching the casket. 
And the man gets up from the power that touches the casket. And then the greatest miracle leading to Jesus' death was Lazarus. But God say, angels, you think that's something for my son raising Lazarus? About what I'm about to do will exceed it. Number one, Lazarus will be laying in a tomb, corrupting. And my son will never see corruption after three days of death. There won't be one ounce of his blood that is corruptible. And you think that Lazarus is something. Lazarus can't come out unless I call him out through my son. He can't come out. But you know, Jesus, Jesus said, I laid down my life and I will take it up again. I'm going to raise my own self from the dead. Woo! I'm going to do it to myself. And when Lazarus came out, he was robed in the grave clothes. And somebody, Jesus, had to say, loose him and let him go. Well, who loosed Jesus? He did it himself. When he came up out of that garment, he was naked. I believe he said, gardener's clothes come. Because when Mary saw him, she saw him with gardener's garments on. And he walked out of there with the garments that he gave himself. And he says to us, I can exceed anything your little pea brain could ever come up with. You let a woman say, all I want is to pay my bills. And Elisha says, what you got in your house? All I got is a little pot of oil. <laughs> a little pot of oil. That's all you got. Well, I got an exceeding God. Before it's over, it's not going to only pay your debts where your boys won't be slaves, but it'll give you living for years and years to come because this is an exceeding God. God doesn't give a calf. He gives a fatted calf. God doesn't give you a robe. He gives you the best robe. He does exceeding abundantly above all that you can ask or think. According. That's a musical term in harmony. According. To the power that works in us. According to his working powers in us. Well, there's the disconnect. I love you, Johnny Mora. Call him Johnny Lessa. <laughs> the disconnect is... The reason why I don't have the things in my life that I need that God wants to impart is because I'm just not expecting it. I come down with a physical problem. I go to the doctor. He says, this is your issue. And I expect that's what's going to happen to me. Everybody listen to me. Your mind is so powerful but all I've got to do is strap something on your head called an instrument of virtual reality. And I can make you sick at your stomach. Why? Because you think you're on a roller coaster when you sit in a chair. Because your mind can play tricks on you that are not real. And the devil comes with his little set, puts it on your head and says, this sickness is under death. Are you going to always have this problem? You'll never get out of this situation. You'll never get your debts paid. All these different things he comes all the time. He is the accuser of the brethren. How often did it say he accused him in, the, in Revelation chapter 12? Day and night. Day and night. Day and night. The thoughts come. Day and night. The battle comes. Come on. Am I right? Your mind is a zoo sometimes and all the animals are out. And everybody, it's just a horrible thing to, to get it all together. That's why I have to renew my mind by the Word of God. It isn't what I feel or think or sing. It is what the Word of God says about me. And it says, if I can believe, if I can expect, and I came with one thought, are you expecting? And I'd like for you to look at the person beside you, you if you are, and I'd like for you to say, I'm expecting. I'm expecting. Jack, are you expecting? I'm expecting. You know what happens when you're expecting? Faith? Stand up.
come on for us, man. <laughs> she doesn't walk quite like that. But you waddle, and quite like it usually is. You eat different. You do things different. You let a woman who is an athlete, she may be an Olympian. And you put her in a war-torn country like Ukraine and she can survive it. But you make her nine months pregnant. It changes everything. And I'm telling you right now, I want to be expecting, Suzanne. I want to be pregnant with the promises of God. Amen. 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 Let's all stand.